Good morning again. Friday night we had a marvelous experience with Hallelujah Harvest. Things went really, really well. And uh, Mr. Scott Williams is here. His lovely wife Tammy, is she's in Kid Zone right now. Is that right? And uh, we hope that's where she is. But uh, they both worked so hard. I know they had a lot of help too. But I want to definitely make sure that we thank Scott and Tammy for all their hard work in this. Thank you so much. Amen. If you, if you volunteered for Hallelujah Harvest in any way, would you please stand? Thank you all so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, did we ever get a count on how many people came through? Believe it or not, over the years there's been much debate among Christians as to which way is the best way to share the gospel. Which way is the best way for us to be witnesses for Christ? Now, I don't have the time to go into the history of it, but basically it comes down to two main perspectives. Some Christians emphasize the ministry of presence, and some emphasize the ministry of of proclamation some presence some proclamation well what is the ministry of presence as the first note on the note sheet provided in the bulletin says the ministry of presence focuses on living out one's faith on a daily basis especially in regard to alleviating human suffering the ministry of presence focuses on living out one's faith on a daily basis, especially in regard to alleviating human suffering. James 1.27 says this, Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Jeremiah 22, 16, speaking of King Josiah, God says, He defended the cause of the poor and needy, and so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord? The ministry of presence is about doing one's best, best to glorify God by meeting people's needs, by making them feel loved. In Matthew 5, Jesus refers to his disciples as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Just as salt was used to penetrate and preserve meat, and light penetrates and dispels darkness, God's people are to penetrate the world and be a preserving or redeeming agent, dispelling the darkness of sin. The world is made better and humanity is blessed by the presence of God's people. That's the ministry of presence. But other Christians emphasize the ministry of proclamation. 
What is the ministry of proclamation? As the note sheet says, the ministry of proclamation focuses on telling the story of Jesus and teaching about sin, judgment, repentance, forgiveness, and eternal life. The ministry of proclamation focuses on telling the story of Jesus and teaching about sin, judgment, repentance, forgiveness, and eternal life. The passage that we uh, took a look at in last week's sermon, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul writes, How can people have faith in the Lord and ask Him to save them if they've never heard about Him? And how can they hear unless someone tells them? And how can anyone tell them without being sent by the Lord? The Scriptures say it is a beautiful sight to see even the feet of someone coming to preach the good news. Yet not everyone has believed the message. For example, the prophet Isaiah asked, Lord, has anyone believed what we said? No one can have faith without hearing the message about Christ. The ministry of proclamation then is about teaching people the truth claims of Christianity and how these truth claims relate to them, especially spiritually. If you want a gross oversimplification of these concepts, I know I'm painting with a wide brush, but you could basically boil it down to this. The ministry of presence primarily focuses on meeting people's physical needs, while the ministry of proclamation focuses more on meeting people's spiritual needs. Now that's an oversimplification. So which approach should we use as we try to reach the world for Jesus? Which approach did Jesus use? Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 9. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 9, that's page 687 in the Bibles provided in the pews. Matthew 9, let's begin in the first verse. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he said to the paralytic, Get up, take up your mat, go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to men. Now, in this passage, we see that Jesus used both the ministry of presence and the ministry of proclamation. He addressed both the man's physical needs and his spiritual needs. It's the same in the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Do you remember that story? He fed them physically with bread and fish, and he fed them spiritually through his teaching. So, as the note sheet says, we must minister both through our presence and our proclamation if we're going to be effective witnesses for Jesus. It's both and. It's not either or. It's both and. Both presence and proclamation. Just telling people about Jesus usually isn't enough. Now, sometimes it is. But most of the time, if all we do is talk to them about it, but we don't live it out, 
it's not enough. You can have half the Bible memorized. You can know exactly which verses to use to show someone about salvation in Scripture. You can know how to lead someone in a sinner's prayer. But if you aren't reflecting the love and the mercy of God in the way that you care for people, then your fine words are going to fall on deaf ears. They won't hear what we have to say. As the old saying goes, don't tell them Jesus loves them until you're ready to love them too. Or another old saying, they won't care how much you know until what? They know how much you care. A few years ago, I was in a local coffee shop talking with a man about spirituality, the Bible, truth, Jesus. This guy's not a Christian yet. And as we talked about all of this, I asked him this question. I said, if you could say anything that you wanted to the churches of Berea, what would you tell them? I don't know if this guy had already been thinking about this, but he didn't even hesitate. His response is immediate. He said, I would tell them, obey the 11th commandment. I said, okay, I may, I may be a pastor, but you got me on that one. What's the 11th commandment? He said, thou shalt not be a hypocrite. Evidently, he was tired of meeting Christians whose actions didn't line up with what they claimed to believe. As the note sheet says, without the ministry of presence, the ministry of proclamation is hypocrisy. Without the ministry of presence, the ministry of proclamation is hypocrisy. If we tell people about Jesus, like the guy, did you see the guy in the video when he said, I witness to everyone, and he had on the shirt and the bracelets and the glove and, and the scripture mints and all this different stuff. And then the guy asked him, the guy off screen said, well, what about sharing your faith with others? What about telling them? about Jesus. And then the guy said, I don't like people. He said, I love Jesus. Well, it doesn't work that way. Unless we are communicating love and mercy and grace through what we do in how, in, in, in how we try to address the needs of people around us, then the ministry of proclamation is hypocrisy. Without the ministry of presence, the ministry of proclamation is hypocrisy. You know what? I think we understand this pretty well already. I think we get that. As a matter of fact, I think that most Christians, or that for most Christians, the ministry of presence is something we gladly engage in. More and more churches are emphasizing the ministry of presence, or social action, as it is sometimes called. For example, in recent years, years here at Berea Baptist. We've sent some of our members on mission teams to do all sorts of wonderful things. We've helped to drill wells for people in Peru so that they can have safe drinking water. We've built homes for widows in Guatemala. Our youth have done home repair for people right here in Madison County. Many of us volunteer for the annual Day of Hope event that comes up in three weeks. And please, I encourage you to, to there's a sign-up sheet out in the hallway to sign up to volunteer for that. You will be blessed. It's an incredible event, and it provides food and services for thousands of people, not just in Madison County, but in the surrounding counties as well. It's the Saturday before Thanksgiving, so check it out. we got sign-ups in the hallway. And in addition to this, every week through our humanitarian ministry team, we provide food and financial assistance to families in Berea who are in very difficult situations. And in addition to all of this, over the years I have often seen members of this church give self-sacrificially to provide for the needs of their fellow church members, their brothers and sisters in Christ right here in this congregation. And I praise God for all that he has done and all he is doing through us in regard to the ministry of presence. Rhea Baptist, you shine brightly in that way. And yet, I think that nowadays, most Christians are uneasy or even reluctant to engage in the ministry of proclamation. 
Ajith Fernando is a longtime Youth for Christ leader who uh, served as a missionary in Sri Lanka. A few years ago, I read an interview with him, and this is one of the things he said. He said, but lately, some disconcerting trends, more course corrections, if you will, have left me feeling uneasy. I hear evangelicals talking a lot about justice and kingdom values, but not about proclaiming the gospel to those of other faiths and winning them for Christ. Of course, if someone asks them about Christianity, they will explain the gospel. Thus, some people will be converted to Christ through their witness. But that is a woefully inadequate strategy. Most of the billions of people in the world who do not know Christ will not come and ask us. We need to take the initiative to go to them. I think it's really not all that surprising that we would start emphasizing the ministry of presence over the ministry of proclamation. I mean, it's a lot safer. What's offensive or controversial about giving someone safe drinking water or building or repairing someone's home or giving someone food or providing financial assistance? The ministry of presence rarely invites persecution. It's safer. But if you mention the name of Jesus, if you teach spiritual truths from the Bible, if you start talking to people about how they can be saved through Jesus and how they need to be saved through Jesus, then you're going to ruffle some feathers. It may be risky or even dangerous depending on where you are. But we dare not neglect the ministry of proclamation. Now earlier I, I said that we've sent all these mission teams to do all these different things and I praise God that we've done all that. All of these ministries. I, and the ministries that I mentioned earlier... They also, they don't just uh, emphasize the ministry of, of presence, but most of those emphasize the ministry of proclamation too, or at least include some sort of component of that. And I think that's great. And we have sent some mission teams in recent years that their primary focus, it wasn't ministry of presence, it was their primary focus was proclamation. Like, for example, the ministry teams we've sent to Southeast Asia with the people group, the unreached people group we've adopted, that unreached people group that now are no longer unreached. God is working in their midst, and praise God for that. But being quite honest with you guys, I'm always honest. I don't always say everything I'm thinking, but now I'll tell you, this is what I'm thinking. Over the years, whenever we're uh, planning some sort of missions activity, whether it's in another country or whether it's right here in Berea or some sort of outreach event, if it's an event or a mission or a ministry that is centered on the ministry of presence, meeting people's physical needs in some practical way, it's usually a lot easier to get people to participate in that than if we schedule some sort of outreach event or ministry or mission that focuses primarily on the ministry of proclamation, of talking to other people about Jesus. It is like pulling teeth to get people to be involved in an event like that. Now, why is that? Now, earlier I said, without the ministry of presence, the ministry of proclamation is hypocrisy, and that's true. However, without the ministry of proclamation, the ministry of presence is incomplete and ultimately unloving. Without the ministry of proclamation, the ministry of presence is incomplete and ultimately unloving. And I know that that's a pretty strong statement to say that that kind of ministry approach in and of itself is unloving. Why would I say this? Listen, Imagine with me for a moment. What if, what if we succeeded in making clean water, food, and adequate medical care 
available to everyone in the world? What if we finally eradicated ignorance and poverty and depression all over the world? What if we succeeded in that? What if we succeeded in doing all of these things but neglected to tell people about Jesus and how they can have eternal life through him? What would be gained? What this brings to mind, at least for me, is something Jesus said. In Mark 8, 36, Jesus said this, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? What do you gain? What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? If we meet people's physical needs, but they still end up separated from God for eternity because we wouldn't tell them about Jesus. Have we really loved them? As the note sheet says, telling people about Jesus and salvation through him is the most loving thing we can possibly do. Because it is the only thing that has eternal consequences. You give, man, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. You heard that? If you teach him about Jesus, he may very well feast forever in the presence of God for all eternity. I stand before you talking about Jesus and preaching and trying to serve him only because at some point in my life someone loved me enough to not only meet my physical needs but to tell me about Jesus, to, to verbally share the gospel with me, to try and help me understand what it meant for Jesus to be born, to die on the cross for my sins, to rise from the dead, why he did all that and what that can mean for me and the invitation that God is, has opened to me and to everyone in the whole world. Someone took the time to explain that to me over multiple occasions. And they did this because they loved me. And if someone hadn't loved me enough to do that, if someone was more concerned about offending me than in giving me what I most needed, I can't even imagine what my life would have been like. Apart from God, can't even imagine it. Because of certain things that happened at certain steps in my life, and I won't go into all that, that's for some other day, I'm not even sure I'd still be here. I think my life wouldn't have lasted this long. But someone loved me. They loved me. So they talked to me and told me about Jesus. And I didn't respond immediately. It took a while. It took a while to sink in. But they loved me. St. Francis of Assisi, Roman Catholic monk. If you've, if you've never read about him, you ought to find a book on his life. Very, very challenging a person of God. Um, he's shown brightly. <laughs> One of his famous quotes is this. Preach at all times and, if necessary, use words. That's a good quote. And he's driving home the point that we preach through much more than our words, don't we? What we do with our actions speaks much more loudly than what we say with our words. So Francis was right in recognizing that our preaching begins through our lifestyle. But his quote fails to recognize that at some point, it will always be necessary to use words. 
I'm afraid that St. Francis' quote is being used more and more by Christians as a rationalization for why we don't have to actually talk with someone about Jesus. Why? Because they'll see Jesus through my actions. Well, they better see Jesus through my actions. They better see Jesus through your actions. But if we've not also communicated about Jesus through our words, then what we are presenting to them is incomplete and unloving. They need more than that. In our Berea Baptist Church vision under the Live the Mission section, two of the goals listed are these. First, Every member of BBC will be trained to share his or her faith. Now, in last week's sermon, I spoke at length about how deplorable it is that the state of the American church is such that we have people who've been an active part of church life for many decades and they still don't feel confident in sharing their faith. How does that happen? Well, in our vision, we as a church, we recognize we don't want that to happen here. So one of the things we're aiming for, one of the goals that we've set up for ourselves is that every single member of Berea Baptist Church will know how to share their faith. Now this spring, you know, we have classes on Wednesday nights. And beginning this spring, we've offered these in the past, this spring we're going to be offering classes on how to share your faith. And if you've never been through something like that, or even if you have, but you've never reached a level of feeling confident in doing it, then I encourage you to watch for that and to be part of that. A lot of people, though, Wednesday nights don't work for them because of their work schedule or whatever. It's not a good time. Uh, They they don't have that time available to come to a class. So if you're part of a life group, Sunday school class or home-based small group, and as much as I've preached about that over the past two months, I know that by this point everyone's in a life group, right? Eh. Kind of a half-hearted. If you're involved in a life group, and if you're not, please, if you need help getting connected, let us know and we'll we'll connect you. But if if you're in a Sunday school class or home-based small group and you would like your life group to, as a group, go through one of these training, uh, this training material. We've got several different kinds. If you want to go through training material on how to share your faith, let us know. Let Russell Cole know, our associate pastor of education, and Russell will be happy to uh, give you the materials we've got. Now, we don't have enough materials so that all life groups at the same time can go through these things. But what we can do is we can put people up on some sort of schedule, and we can make sure it gets passed around and everybody gets that opportunity. Okay? Everyone. We want everyone trained to be able to share their faith. We want every member of BBC to be confident in talking with non-Christians about Jesus, especially in light of the next goal in our vision. It is this. Each year, every member of BBC will verbally share the gospel with at least one person who's not yet a Christian. How's that for a goal? This isn't a requirement. There's not going to be the Berea Baptist Mafia going around saying, did you share your faith? You know, it's not going to, we're not going to do that. It's a goal. It's a target that we're setting up for all of us to remind us of our mission as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Each year, every member of BBC will verbally share the gospel with at least one, at least one person who's not yet a Christian. Now, some of you are already confident in sharing your faith. And some of you, you're active that way. And for those of you like that, you may be looking at that and you're thinking, well, that's not much of a goal. At least one person setting the bar a little low, aren't we? While others here, maybe, you know, you're like most American Christians and you don't feel confident in sharing your faith. You feel uncomfortable with it. And you're looking at that and that makes you break out in a sweat. That's intimidating for you. That's why we said at least one. Because if every member of this church shares their faith verbally with at least one person, that would be dramatic compared to what happens in most churches around this country. I remember seeing a survey a few years ago, and I don't know if this statistic is still current. This is from about maybe eight years ago. Surveys had shown that only two or three percent 
of Christians in this country verbally share their faith with, uh, with non-Christians? Only 2 or 3%. If we are to live the mission that God has given us, then we've got to be willing to bear fruit by making disciples. Let me ask you this. How long has it been since you personally, verbally, shared the gospel with someone who does not yet know Jesus? How long has that been? Have you ever had that joy, that privilege? And the way it works, guys, for most people, is, yeah, the first time you do it, your palms are sweaty, you know, your heart's beating a little faster. Like, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, help, 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 give me words. And you take out and you make a step of faith and you do it. And what you find out most of the time, most of the time, you find out, you know what, that wasn't so hard. They, they didn't, you know, eat me. That's not so hard. And, and the more you do it, the more you find, hey, I can do this. And, and especially when you share faith with someone, and if you lead someone to Jesus, if someone prays to receive Christ and they make a commitment to Jesus because of your witness to them, it will radically change your experience as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you will be praying, Lord, please give me more opportunities to share my faith. What I'm trying to say is I know it look, may look intimidating to dive in and do it, but get those toes in. Take that step. Jump in. The water's fine. If we are to live the mission that God has given us, then we must bear fruit by making disciples. It goes hand in hand. We saw that in last week's sermon. Bearing fruit for God means that we live our lives in such a way that other people are drawn to Jesus through our actions and through our words. Does your presence, the way you live, does it point people to Jesus? Meeting people's physical needs. Working, you know, working for mercy and forgiveness and love and justice and righteousness to have the upper hand in the world. Do your actions, the way you live, your lifestyle, does that point other people to Jesus? Do your words. Do your words point other people to Jesus? Are you willing to talk to somebody about it? You've got something to say. You say, well, I don't know what to say. Sure you do. If you're a Christian, you've got something to say. Because if you're a Christian, then I'm assuming you know the basic story of Jesus. Share that. And you know your own story share that. That's all you got to need to know. In order to talk to someone about Jesus, you guys just got to tell two stories. The story of Jesus and your story. That's it. Say, so, well, what if I'm not able to answer all their questions? You're not going to be able to answer all the questions. Only God could answer all the questions that ever exist. But what I've found is that the vast majority of the time, that's not as much of an obstacle as some people make it out to be. Because if you are operating in the ministry of presence, if you are loving them through your actions consistently over a period of time, that when you talk to them and share with them about Jesus, they're going to listen. Even if you don't know the answer to all possible questions, they're going to listen. And God can use it to touch their heart and soften their heart. And it may take a while, but eventually that Word of God gets down into their heart and starts doing this amazing work. Are we willing to share the good news of Jesus Christ through the ministry of presence, through our actions, and through the ministry of proclamation, through what we say. Would everyone please stand and would the musicians please take their places? If you are ready to make some sort of public commitment for the Lord Jesus Christ, this is your time. We're entering into a time of invitation, and as is the tradition in this church and in many others, the way we do this is the, the pastor and the associate pastor stand at the front, and if you are serious enough 
about whatever God's been doing in your heart that you're like, you know what, I want to make this public. I want people to know that, yes, I'm rededicating my life. Or I want people to know that, yes, I am accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. I want to give my life back to the God who gave it to me in the first place. I want to worship Him by laying my life down and surrender. You can do that. Maybe the Lord is leading you to become a member here at Berea Baptist. And you want to come, you want to talk to me about that or talk to one of the associate pastors about that. Whatever it is, this is, this is your time. This is God's time in working in, our, in us and working in his people. So I invite you to come. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, loving Lord, gracious God, thank you so much for your patience with us. Oh, Father, please, help us to carry your name well by how we live, by what we say. Thank you so much that someone loved me enough at some point to talk to me about you. Please, Lord, help me and help us to love others enough to talk to them, to share your story, to share our story. Stir our hearts, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of allowing us to serve as your ambassadors your representatives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.